8 p.m. now. Uh, let's start. And um, I would like to welcome everybody to our webinar, Britain and Bridges, episode four. Uh, dear colleagues, dear panelists, dear participants, it's my pleasure and honor to host this conference today evening. And um, I would like to thank everybody that you're agreeing to take a part in this conference. Um, my pleasure, Dr. Rubon, Andriy Rubon, Ukraine, our uh, first speaker, and uh, Dr. Zoran Tomic from Belgrade, Serbia, and also Uppsala, Sweden, uh, Dr. Professor Mario Romano, Bergamo, Italy, hi, and uh, Professor Nikolakopoulos from Greece, Thessaloniki, hello. Hello uh, Today, our topic is about retinal detachment, uh, surgery of the retinal detachment um, with, uh, in, in detail. We will talk about um, very important, maybe small, but important detail. Um, so we have a very interesting agenda and uh, two hours. So uh, I would like to ask Dr. Ruben to start from your presentation. And we have almost uh, 100 participants. I uh, would like to ask you, please send your question uh, into the chat. I will, uh, I will ask our panelists. Dear colleagues, uh, it is a great honor and privilege for me to take part in the Retina Bridge Forum meeting uh, with such a great team. I'm going to share my experience in the primary vitrectomy for regmatogenous retinal detachment. Uh, what we are doing in the operating theater mainly depended what, uh, by what we believe in. And today we'll only talk about what I personally believe. Uh, firstly, it's fake of vitrectomy. I believe in the benefits of combi surgery, both for patient and for the surgeon. I have been performing it in all my patients over 40 years of old of, uh, with reliable axial lens. The choice of you all is determined by perspective of improving vision after surgery. Uh, basically, I used 25 DH vitrectomy, which in my opinion gives an, the optimal balance between the stiffness of the instruments flow characteristics and tightness of the sclerotomies. It is essential to remove as much vitreous as possible without creating a new retinal breaks. A scleral depression under wide angle visualization with additional illumination is very effective for this purpose. If the posterior haloid is detached, I prefer to start by manual vitrectomy from the periphery as this approach reduces retinal traction and allows me to walk on a more stable retina. All traction should be removed from each retinal breaks. It is crucial to remove traction on the anterior edge of the flap. Amputation of the tip from, uh, amputation of the tip uh, of the flap is sometimes helpful also. Uh, another reason for subtotal vitrectomy in retinal detachment surgery is to achieve the maximum volume of the gas of silicone or, or silicone bulb for tamponade. I mostly peel ILM in the macula of retinal detachment cases, uh, since I believe this reduces the number of postoperative complications such as the macula edema, macula hole, and macula proliferation, and can increase the functional outcome of the surgery and reduce the number of the reoperations. I have been using membrane blue dual and perform peeling ILM under PSCL, no more than two D diameters. Also, the optimum point of peeling, peel initiation is uncertain. I try to start peeling in the horizontal meridian temporally, about 1,000 microns from the center of the forward, where the ILM is thickest and, the, and has maximum rigidity. And recently, I use asymmetrical peeling, saving ILM over the papillon macular nerve fiber bundle. In support of the above, uh, a couple of clinical examples. First case is macular own retinal detachment and pre-op vision 0.8. Facovitrectomy plus SX6 was performed, no ILM peeling, one week after surgery. This was the same, retina was attached, one month post-op, Visus 0.4 due to cystoid macula edema. 
two months post-op visual decreased dramatically to 0.05 and the OCT confirmed epiretinal membrane. A repeat surgery was performed with epiretinal membrane and ILMP link and visual improved to 0.7, but with abnormal foveal contour. Second case is macula of retinal detachment, facovitrectomy plus ILM peeling plus SF6. Six months after surgery, patient had epiretinal proliferation, but without foveal involving due to ILM peeling. Visual acuity 0.7 remains stable throughout the follow-up period. And the third case is macula of retinal detachment, no ILM peeling, one week post-op, BCVA 0.6, at one month post-op, 0.8, but at six months post-op, patient had full sickness, macula hole. Then repeated vitrectomy with ILM peeling. After that, macula hole was closed with fortunately perfect vision recovery. In cases of retinal detachment with full sickness macula hole, I always remove epiretinal membrane and uh, ILM in this case, both epiretinal membrane and uh, ILM are well visualized and their simultaneous removal was performed. Uh, I, I, uh, the inverted ILM flap technique, I only use in higher axial myopic eye in such cases. And also I always drain subretinal fluids through the macula hole. In a few hours, OCT revealed complete macula hole closure. In retinal detachment surgery, I prefer to shave the vitreous basis under the air, so-called dry vitrectomy, because this technique allows me to get good wide field visualization, peripheral vitreous, and cutting vitreous on the more stable retina. If ILO, EOL uh, intracolor lens fogging occurred during fluid air change in pseudophagic patients treated with posterior capsulotomy, I wipe the posterior surface of the EOL with a cannula or cutter. I don't use viscoelastic because uh, an optically thick and irregular coating layer deteriorates of the visibility. Sometimes I use bubble wiping technique proposed by Kintaro Yudo. As usual, primary brick can be used for internal drainage of subretinal fluid. fluid. But uh, with, peripheral, with peripheral breaks, uh, residual subretinal fluid in macula area can occur. I don't like to leave a significant amount of fluid in the macula, especially with gas tamponade, as I would not like to get macula fold after surgery. In such cases, a posterior drainage retinotomy are required. It can be initiated by using endocalter or uh, subretinal cannula 41 gauge without the dermy. This is an example of macula fold after retinal detachment vitrectomy. Its patient was operated on, uh, in another clinic to straighten the fall, a subretinal BSS was injected in several points of entry and drainage retinotomy was created. After the PFCL was injected from the lower parts of the retina, tissue manipulator was used to straighten the fold. Then PFCL air change 
with a maximum aspiration of subretinal fluid was performed. Post opacity revealed almost complete resolution of the fault in a few hours. I don't perform regularly 360 degree laser treatment because I, I'm not sure exactly that this uh, approach reduces the risk of post operative retinal detachment. But in those cases, when I do it, I don't touch horizontal meridians. And I, of course, uh, I very like cryo. I would like to emphasize the importance of removing the PFCL bubble as completely as possible at the end of the operation. And uh, BSS rings after PFCL exchange may help to collect the microscopic PFCL drops. The problem is that the complete removal of PFCL during vitrectomy is not possible, and remnants always remain on the retina. Residual PFCL can dissolve in silicone oil over the time, and the adhesion of the silicone oil to the PFCL remnants can lead to the sticky silicone uh, oil behavior. Sticky silicone oil is first described by Freiberg as a phenomenon occurring during conventional silicone oil removal when patches of silicone uh, oil-like material remnants glued to the retina. We had several cases of sticky heavy silicone oil in retinal detachment surgery. It is very, very uncomfortable. First of all, because they use high vacuum relatively close to the retina may lead to complications such as choroidal hemorrhage and retinal tears. Residual silicone can impair, can impair vision in the post-op period and require reoperation. And it's also lead to increasing the duration and the cost of the operation. In order to reduce the risk of sticky silicone oil, we should achieve complete removal of PFCL before silicone oil insertion. Performed fluid PFCL air exchange to prevent direct contact between PFCL and silicone oil. Extra time of contact PFCL within air could evaporate it. We can also use a colored PFCL, which facilitate its visualization as proposed by Stanislaw Rizzo. A saline rinse after PFCL exchange may also help to collect the microscopic drops, as we showed previously, and complete removal of the vitreous by using, for example, triamcinolone acetonide may also be helpful to reduce the possibility for sticky silicone oil, as proposed David Wong. Uh, how safety remove sticky silicone oil? First of all, it can be uh, removed from the retina with the use of semifluorinate alkanes. But PFCL is also helpful in the removal of sticky silicone oil because the adhesion of PFCL is greater than adhesion of silicone oil to the retina. And the heating, the BC, BSS used for infusion may also facilitate the sticky remnants to be, to be removed. To minimize complication, silicone oil is removed once the retinal anatomy is stable. I use high suction, which is applied through cannula with removable valve. This method allows me maximally use the inner diameter of the cannula, which, according to Poazello, increases the flow rate. It is very effective even for silicone 5,000 centistops. If emulsification is present, it is very difficult to remove all drops of silicone. For this reason, we have to perform liquid air exchange several times and hold the vitrectomy probe at the level of the fluid air interface. To avoid a hydro blow to the macula, I break the irrigation stream with the probe. In my experience, uh, my experience suggests that the choice of tamponade agent should be individualized for each patient. It depends on number of breaks, uh, size, location, vision of the fellow eye, and many other uh, features. Uh, both agents achieve similar favorable, favorable anatomical outcome in series of eye with a primary retinal detachment and low-grade PVR. 
And pen, uh, but patients manage with gas temp and achieve a better visual outcome with fewer complications. As a conclusion, I would like to present final cases. Uh, this is a man 34 years of old after a severe blunt trauma of the right eye with the hematocornus, hematocornia, and the retinal detachment on B scan. Uh, the operation was performed under general anesthesia. Uh, the hope for at least some kind of visualization of deep lying structures disappear after several seconds. This Y center of the damage corner is removed. and lens exchange was performed. And then temporary keratoprothesis by Klaus Eggert was placed and fixed with sutures. Twenty five gauge vitrectomy was performed. Posterior cortex was elevated and removed uh, as much peripherally as possible. ELM was peeled on the detached retina. Uh, and after PFCL injection, peripheral vitrectomy was completed. Then laser and I was tamponated with silicone oil. At the end of the surgery, instead of an allograft transplantant, the patient's refined coronal bottom was sutured back. After six months, uh, six months later, penetrating keratoplasty was performed. Then after three months, extraction of silicone oil. After another two months, glaucoma surgery. And uh, at 12 months post-op, BCV was 0 0.1, but with uh, increase in trochlear pressure, but retina is attached. Which approach is better? One-step keratoplasty or delayed keratoplasty? In my practice, an allograft was not transplanted during the vitrectomy at the acute phase of the injury. Instead, the patient's opaque cornea was sutured back. Several reasons for this strategy. Uh, first of all, gametocornea is sometimes reversible. Secondly, the injured eye are usually still inflamed at the time of the vitrectomy, which increases the risk of graft failure. 
Dr. Reuters showed that the failure was more frequent for eyes that were grafted within eight weeks of trauma. And lastly, problems with intraocular pressure in post-op period have an extremely negative effect on the condition of the graft. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rubman. Fantastic presentation. Amazing video case. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yes, of course. Uh, could I ask you uh, from the beginning, uh, do you prefer uh, make ILM peeling in every cases routinely for mm -hmm. retinal detachment? For primary retinal detachment case, I prefer to remove ILM only in the macula of retinal detachment. Uh, because as I showed, uh, there are many post-operative complications I examine after surgery when I leave ILM. Uh, thank you. And I agree with you that uh, drive it. Yes, please, Dr. Romano. Yeah, the very interesting, really, you know, great videos. Uh, the point to, the, to do the peeling in retinal detachment, uh, uh, we need to think if it's an epiretinal membrane, in that case, probably we left a, a vitreous crisis, or it's not an epiretinal membrane, but it's a PVR, okay, and is mostly related to the migration of retinal pigment epithelium. So um, uh, uh, the point is, uh, if we think that uh, that eye can develop the PVR, because there is uh, some probably some uh, uh, retinal pigment epithelium that can uh, go on the retina, probably, you know, we need to do the peeling. I don't know if you agree or not. Uh, yes, you are right to a certain extent when you say the, the main reason for proliferation and is, uh, for example, retinal pigment epithelium cell. And it's very important uh, when we see exactly a retinal membrane to, to remove it. But for me, uh, prophylactical ILM peeling, it's enough reasonable because I, I repeat that uh, I have enough cases with uh, reproliferation with uh, loss of vision after repeated surgery. And for my opinion, it's not so severe procedure. I know from macular hole surgery that uh, Raminta Dayoni showed that uh, enough dimpling of ILM uh, and as uh, he, he, he published, but I never uh, seen some problem with quality of vision after LM peeling in patient with re primary retinal detachment. Um, for my opinion, this may be not so severe problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I ask you about dry vitrectomy? Uh, I agree with you that when the cavity is dry, we can clearly, we can see the vitreous uh, very clearly. Do you perform this uh, vitrectomy as a separately step or as an additional process when you see uh, residual vitreous? Uh, I use dry vitrectomy, so-called dry vitrectomy, uh, when I, I, I cutting the far peripheral vitreous. Uh, for my opinion, it's very important, but it's not so easy, even with good and too modern machine with vacuum control, with high rate cutter. Mm -hmm. uh, but for my opinion, it's very useful procedure. I've enough, yeah, I perfect uh, visualized uh, peripheral vitreous under the air. I have stable retina and uh, I have the possibilities to remove as much as possible to aura serrata the vitreous. For my opinion, it's very useful approach uh, to do it. And you see the, uh, the proliferation PVR uh, process after detachment is less in this patient. The problem of PVR, progression PVR, maybe it uh, depends on not only, uh, not only one, one factor as a quark, uh, quality of vitreous, living vitreous. Mm -hmm. There are many other factors, but I agree with you completely that it's one of the most important factors. 
and we should to remove as vitreous as much as possible for several reasons. First of all, as of really, we remove the basis of vitreous and we decrease the, the possibility to reproliferation. Also, we can use the maximum volume of gas bulbul or silicon oil bul bulbul for tamponade. As we know, it's very important for uh, buoyancy force for, for close to, to, to tears. Uh, this is why there are many reasons to, to remove vitreous uh, maximally, completely. Thank you. Uh, could I ask you from um, participants' chat, um, do you perform active or passive aspiration uh, of subretinal fluid through macular hole? I use, I, I use passive aspiration. I don't like active because it's maybe not so not so safety. It's enough enough uh, enough uh, possibility to remove all fluid through through the cannula 25 gauge. Really, if you use smaller gauges, it's 25 or maybe even uh, 38 as uh, one of procedure to remove subretinal fluid. Especially in case uh, which uh, subretinal fluid is more viscous, it's very difficult to perform it passively. In such cases, yeah, I agree with you. It's possible to use uh, active control, but it's it's very it's very safe. It's very uh, pay attention can be used. Thank you. Um, we know that um, we can uh, we can treat the fault not only with uh, BSS injection but with ILM peeling also. And uh, we have question: Is it better to peel? ILM before injection subretinal BSS with 41 gauge. Yes, I think yes, but in my cases, the patient uh, which I operated on was peeled previously during first surgery, in my colleagues. Yeah, okay. Is there a, any difference in the development of sticky oil between PFCL and Perfluor? What, what octane, maybe. Yeah, yeah, octane. It's, it's a difficult question. Uh, I think the possibility to dissolve in perfluoral decaline is about five times greater high than in perfluoroctan to silicon oil. And uh, there are many papers uh, in which authors find uh, some, some kind of uh, Perfluor decaline and octane in silicone oil, a sticky silicone oil remnant which removed from eyes. I, I, I don't have great, a big experience with perfluor octane, but uh, for my opinion, with uh, decaline, is maybe will be greater chance to have silico, uh, sticky silicone oil. Okay, thank you. Um... We have the question about ILM peeling without PFCL, but uh, honestly, we will have the uh, section about manipulation, and I want to ask uh, this question later. Um, but we saw that you uh, removed ILM also under the PFCL and without. Yeah. Uh, Dear Dr. Ruben, thank you for the great cases. What was the cause of high IOP in the last? Yeah, uh, I think we should discuss last case. Um, was there some inflammation? Do you use midriatics in post-op mm. period? From Czech Republic, Alina Bilecka. Uh, first of all, the uh, cause of uh, intraocular pressure is the secondary glaucoma. I, I, I think it's a trauma, severe trauma. Uh, the reason we, of course, we use some midriatic, but uh, we can't control uh, pupil pupil uh, diameter because uh, corner was unclear. But uh, maybe maybe it's also useful to, to use some midriatics in such cases. Could we uh, could we discuss the last um, video? Uh, you, uh, your questions are to our panelists also, yes? Um, could we ask uh, Dr. Zoran about keratoprothesis? Should, should we do it simultaneously or 
without uh, all two steps procedure? What's your approach? Uh, I think I would do the uh, simultaneous uh, auto keratoprothesis prothesis only if I, I am uh, forced to do it. I would try always to remove the epithelium first because it sometimes it might be enough to to get the proper vision inside the eye then in in my opinion it improves during the operation so if you say try to save the corner but sometimes it's difficult to say it, it is impossible then you are forced to do it i have another comment about uh, there was a one question from the audience from, from participants and that was unfolding the macular fold uh, do, to do the ilm uh, peeling before or after the blab. I think it's always better to do it after the blab because if you start to do ILM peeling and then inject the BSS under the retina, you risk the macular hole. So it's better to do the blab first and ILM peeling after. This is the uh, the message for the audience. Thank you. For, for uh, Dr. Ruben, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Nikolakopoulos. Well, I have no experience of removing the, uh, the cornea because I'm trying, even in endophthalmitis cases where everything is hazy, to increase the light inside the eye. One of the major achievements of uh, the DORC uh, uh, simultaneously 30 degree two light pipes in the eye as chandelier is that you can enhance the light so much that you can do it with experience, of course, you can do a basic vitrectomy even with a foggy cornea. Uh, I hate to remove corneas because it's not my subject so much. And uh, the guy who was doing a lot of job and he would, used to be my best friend like uh, Cesare Forlini used to say that it's a pole to pole surgery. That means cornea, cataract, retina. So I have no, not much experience on that, but I do try to finish the case uh, as far as I can with, uh, without removing the cornea. But that's my idea. It has nothing to do with anybody else. Thank you. Professor Romano. I also try to keep the cornea and try you know, a different angle in order to see through the, you know, the scar or um, removing the epithelium. Uh, there are a few, in case we need to do, uh, uh, there, is a few, there are a few papers that says that the, the coating the endothelium can help in the post-op to keep the cornea um, clear and to protect to, uh, you know, inflammation, emotion, but uh, at the end, I mean, uh, is not working still so well. And, uh, you know, the, the rate of uh, inner rejection is still very high. So uh, the best option, uh, as you already said, you know, is try to keep it and then to do it later on. Thank you. Uh, we have one question. What is argument for using decaline, if any, how we need to create a central retinotomy? I think it's about residual subretinal liquid. Uh, do you perform it when you have a huge amount of this liquid or routinely or not routinely, but what cases do you prefer to do it? Is question for me? Yes, uh, when, when uh, you, um, you showed us the retinotomy, when you have residual subretinal liquid uh, under the macula. Yeah. Uh, first of all, really, I don't like uh, a, a, big, a, a big volume of uh, subretinal fluid. I tried to carefully to remove liquid uh, without retinotomy through primary breaks. It's maybe not so easy because retina is hydrophilic, it's many liquid uh, attached to retina. And sometimes uh, how, how carefully uh, I, I did it, but unfortunately in macular area, sometimes we have liquid. But I think it's question more about uh, falls because the question was, uh, if I performed central posterior retinotomy, for, for what reason uh, use perfluor liquid? Uh, I think, first of all, because to, to refold the, the, the fold, uh, and, and for, for first reason. 
And I also use uh, central retinotomy for trying to remove subretinal proliferation. Unfortunately, without success so far, uh, that's why the retinotomy was too posterior to proliferation scar. But if in this case, uh, primary retinal detachment with uh, residual subretinal fluid, I try to use very, very tiny retinotomy, very, because uh, thermo damage and uh, it's not so good in the macula area. I agree completely. And uh, I never use laser after that also to, to, to protect and not increase the uh, size of uh, scotoma induced by laser, central laser. Let me, let me get involved in that discussion because I had a similar problem today. Uh, I'm draining through the hole most of the time. And the physics of draining through the hole is that you're draining through the hole in order to flatten the periphery of the eye. You cannot flatten the center of the eye while draining from the hole. And then that gives you the opportunity to do laser or to do cryo on a flat retina at the area of the hole. But it leaves always a retina fluid behind it. And if you try to exchange completely, if you have to go to the disc in order to remove all the fluid and inject air, then you'll find out by physics again that the, the, the fluid is pushed all of it to the area of the macula. And you have a redetachment also at the macula when you see that the area is flat. But on the other hand, I'm sure you, you're quite, uh, uh, on the other hand, if you close the tear, Remember that we used to do buccal surgery and we used to do uh, also uh, pneumatic retinopexy without discussing the issue at all, without saying that you leave, of course, in buccal surgery, you leave fluid under the macula with uh, you just closing the hole. So the pigment epithelial pump can work on removing the fluid in most of the cases. As about the folds you're making, I always try to put my patients face down for 45 minutes to an hour before, uh, before they stand up. And uh, this gives me a very limited amount of faults, one or two faults in my whole career, which is very little in order to do. But I do have complications and I do see complications from posterior uh, retinotomies. Because if posterior, if by accident you have a PVR and you have a posterior retinotomy, then posterior retinotomy is involved to the PVR and becomes bigger. And then you have a problem in the center of the eye. But nevertheless, drying out the eye is not my style. I would leave some fluid. And sometimes if you leave some fluid and some gas, not draining completely when you make the exchange, it will uh, let you not to have a, a fold. If you just drain it completely and then you put face down or face up the patient, then you might have a fold much easier because you're pushing the, the fluid from the periphery to the center by just injecting gas. I know it's a complicated issue, but I would like to see a little bit of fluid. I don't care about a little bit of fluid as long as I'm closing the tears completely. If I'm sure that the tears are completely closed, I don't mind. The next presentation uh, uh, of Zoran Tomic. Mm. Okay, Logically, I, I just want uh, to yes. make a comment yes, on, on the residual fluid what, uh, and to tell my tricks and tips about it. I, I, I agree with, with the Tanasi Nicolacopoulos. I would try to avoid posterior retinotomy and how, how I'm doing. If I have a lot of fluid left, I tried to inject perfluorocarbon under the air and press the uh, residual amount of fluid peripherally. And then uh, I have at the end some fluid, but uh, much less uh, than in the beginning. So it is a pos there is a possibility to repeat the uh, perforate carbon under the air. Okay, now we can continue with the- uh, Yes, yes, please. This is uh, going to be about the uh, a uh, choice of the uh, technique, uh, whether we are going to use primary vitrectomy or scleral buckling. And uh, 
I think uh, that uh, we have both advantages and disadvantages of both techniques. First, uh, buckling is a very simple procedure, mostly extraocular, which lowers the risk of post-operative end of talmitis. It is a uh, th it gives a better visual result in fake eyes according to SPR study, and slower progress in uh, redetachment occurs. Disadvantages, however, are uh, it is difficult to detect all retinal breaks preoperatively, and preoperative examination in that case is essential for the success unless you use the chandelier for the operation. Traction is released but still there. Uh, there is post-operative astigmatism and inflammation after such a surgery and risk of submacular hemorrhage in case of puncture. Uh, there is a myopic shift and vitreous opacities after the surgery. Advantages of a primary vitrectomy are better perioperative detection of all retinal breaks and preoperative examination in that case is less important. It is a theological treatment because the removal of mean, uh, vitreous means lower risk of traction at any other site of the retina. There is no postoperative uh, astigmatism and inflammation and no need for extra puncture, which lowers the risk of, uh, no, there is no risk of submacular hemorrhage. Thus, disadvantages of primary vitrectomy are cataract de development, uh, which uh, can be overcome by combined fake or vitrectomy. Uh, there is a bit higher recurrence rates, which is rapidly spreading. Need for intraocular tamponade, which uh, temporarily impairs vision or uh, gives forbidden flights if gas is used, or need for a second surgery for in case of silicon oil tamponade. And the redetachment is difficult to detect in a gas filled eye for uh, people that are following the uh, uh, retinal surgery. So, which cases are suitable for scleral buckling? In my opinion, and not only my opinion, according to literature as well, it is a simple retinal detachment with good visibility of the fundus, single breaks, limited retinal detachment, and no PVD. And cases that are suitable for primary vitrectomy are giant tears, vitreous hemorrhage, breaks at the posterior pole, and proliferative vitroretinopathy. But there is a large gray zone between those techniques, uh, which makes uh, medium complex retina detachments with multiple large or unusually shaped breaks, breaks central to the equator, or uh, retina detachment in pseudophagic eyes. I will tell just a few words to remind you on the SPR study, uh, which was conducted in 2007 and published by Hyman. It is a multi centric study, multi centric study. Uh, where 45 surgeons and, uh, from 25 centers were involved and the uh, uh, primary retina detachment of medium complexity was uh, uh, the uh, case that those cases were involved in the study. There was 416 phakic and 265 pseudo phakic eyes and the result is actually that in phakic eyes visual acuity is significantly better using scleral buckling but in pseudophagic eyes, anatomical results were sometimes something better with vitrectomy, but visual acuity was similar using both techniques. So in, in, with other uh, words, there is some place for scleral buckling and we are not allowed to forget this technique. So anatomical results, according to published data for scleral buckling, reattachment rate with single surgery is 80% and final anatomical result success is uh, 90 to 95%. For primary vitrectomy, uh, according to literature, reattachment rates with single operation varies from 64 to 100%. So there is a more variation of the result depending on a, a surgery. And final anatomical result is uh, success is uh, 82 to 100%. Our anatomical result from Sweden, because we had this is, this is a different group of eyes that we had in Sweden, because in, in Sweden we operate very fresh detachments. In, in Serbia we get a detachment with a longer duration. Um, and the, the scleral buckling or primary vitrectomy was followed for 20 years by uh, calling uh, Petro and Christ and me, and we found the uh, reattachment rate with single surgery in 94% and final anatomical success in 99% uh, of cases. 
and functional results for primary vitrectomy, uh, according to published data and complications were visual acuity equal or better than 0.4 was uh, achieved in 32 to 90% and postoperative PVR uh, between zero and 20%. In our results uh, with scleral buckling and or vitrectomy, visual acuity equal to or better than 04 was achieved in 85% and postoperative PORS was seen in 2% according to operated database that was followed for 20 years in Uppsala. So how to perform buckling? Uh, I use three uh, by five millimeters elastic sponge, which I almost always uh, place parallel with Dora Serati, seldom radially, under ophthalmoscopic control or with chandelier illumination. If I use encircling band, band, then I use 40 band uh, uh, at the equator and I shorten it for 12 millimeters. And then exocryo I use under ophthalmoscopical or with chandelier illumination. Uh, the, there is a place for ex uh, external puncture I use it with a puncture diatermy and it uh, secures the placement of a retinal tear on a sponge, creates a space for a sponge uh, placement. It is a must for inferior breaks due to the viscosity of subretinal fluid and no submacular hemorrhage was uh, seen uh, when we use the puncture diatermy that I used for 20 or even more, more years. So I wanted to just to, to remind uh, the younger uh, audience how to perform the, uh, the scleral buckling, we use uh, uh, two millimeters, 40 band, and uh, where to place it. We always do the biometry before the uh, vitrectomy, any vitrectomy. Even if we don't use, uh, do the combined surgery, if you do the lens pairing, we, we always do the biometry and put the uh, uh, band directly at the equator. I wanted to show how I uh, tied the, uh, uh, in, in circling band, I use the sleeve and I don't measure. In, in the beginning, I measured shortening for 12 millimeters, but now I do the preliminary pulling of the, uh, the, the uh, band and I put the suture on a side of a, a sleeve. And it gives me a possibility to tighten or release the uh, imp indentation at the end of the surgery because uh, the, uh, at the end of a vitrectomy, the eye is going to be softer and it, it might be that I need to release some. If I put the suture through the sleeve, then it is impossible. But I, if I put it on a side, then it then is possible to, to adjust it. Uh, now uh, the technique for uh, retinal detachment, we use uh, small gauge 25G as uh, Dr. Ruben as well. Uh, because I think that the size and the uh, flexibility of, of uh, the of instruments are proper. Four ports with the chandelier illumination allows for bimanual work, which I'll uh, always use for, to, to be able to do the self-indentation, wide angle viewing uh, using uh, recite and combined phaco and uh, vitrectomy for uh, patients older than 50. So I wanted to show you uh, one case of the young boy, five years old, and how important it is to uh, create the PVD. It is the biggest failure to do the tamponade before you are completely sure that you have removed as much vitreous as possible. And for that reason, uh, for uh, pediatric cases and for high myopia, I always use triamcinolone. For other cases, no. There is a, usually, in most of the cases, uh, PV, PVD, which is already present, but not in children and not in high myopic patients. In high myopic patients or myopic patients, there is a risk for uh, vitreous crisis. And then uh, we, you see the removal of the inferior part of the hyaloid, but you are not allowed to be satisfied with this one. You have to look for all the remnants of the PVD. The worst thing is to put the, the gas or silicone oil over it because you, then you will get immediately PVR and all the uh, repeated surgeries. Now you see the removal of the upper part. And when you are completely safe, there is uh, some remnants of the uh, uh, vitreous at the macula, which is also removed. And then when, when we have completely removed, then we can proceed. proceed. And then when the retina is completely mobile and freed of 
all the remnants of uh, vitreous and hyaluronic, the, then we do the uh, uh, flattening of the retina using uh, perfluorocarbon. In this case, since it was a pediatric case, there was a uh, encircling band which we placed in 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 uh, uh, cases like pediatric surgery, high myopic, myopic patients, and inferior detachments. And then we can under the perfluorocarbon when we press the uh, vitreous in the periphery, then it's easier and, and more controlled to do the uh, vitreous-based shaving even under the uh, fluid. It, it has not to be the air, but this is one of solutions. And uh, we, after that, uh, we do the uh, three or four, two, three uh, layers of, of uh, laser treatment around the tears. In this case, since uh, it was a child, and then uh, we were uh, not quite sure that whether there was uh, another tear or, or not. We did the uh, 360 laser, especially in children, you are sensitive to do it, and you want to do the diagnostic therapeutic laser treatment, which we did. And we finished the case with the uh, gas tamponade. Here is the fluid air exchange with uh, aspiration of the residual fluid at the uh, end of the surgery and residual per perfluorocarbon, and then the uh, suction of the fluid at the macula at the end of the surgery. So, uh, and uh, now I wanted to show you some examples uh, which are typical and then mostly for the audience, but for participants as well. Uh, the first case is uh, one uh, 35 years old male myopic, clear lens, focal superior temporal detachment with a single horseshoe tear and macolone. What would you do? Pneumatic retinopexy, sclera buckling, sponge only, uh, encircling band on sponge or primary vitrectomy. Can we put what, the... What the size of this tear? Is it giant or middle? No, no, no just a horseshoe no. tear, normal. Horseshoe tear in the super, super temporal detachment with a single horseshoe tear. Uh, my answer eight. Okay. And others, what do you say? <laughs> I like scleral buckling. Okay. Scleral buckle. Good. But for, 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 for young patients, and um, clear lens is scleral buckle all the way in every case. Yeah, I, I agree completely. There is no PVD in, in this case, and that's what we did. We do, did the cryo sponge and air without puncture and the retina was uh, attached with one surgery and the visual acuity was one zero. Second case, 64 years old female pseudophagic, total retinal detachment with multiple breaks in all quadrants, macula off, visual acuity was hand movement and poor vision in the other eye. What would you do? Scleral buckling, encircling bang and sponge, Primary vitrectomy gas or silicon oil or combined encircling band vitrectomy? I vote for B. Yeah. Primary vitrectomy gas or silicon oil. Okay. Yeah, well. yeah B. And we did the uh, uh, laser, uh, the, the vitrectomy with silicon oil since the uh, vision in the other eye was poor. And uh, uh, I decided not to put the encircling band be, 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 because it was older patient. Uh, I mean, uh, younger older patient. <laughs> and the, and the, the, the uh, contraction of the residual vitreous is not as uh, dangerous as in younger patients. So retina was with, attached with one surgery. Silicon oil was uh, successfully removed and visual acuity, I cannot see it was, uh, how can you? Two, two ten. Yes, yes. Yeah. I have to remove this uh, visual. Uh, yes, zero point two. Yes. Put on your glasses. No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, uh, this is. Uh, I have you here. Only, only <laughs> Romano is young between us. Only. <laughs> yeah. Everybody. Is, Everybody is needs glasses. Yes. No, so no, I, I need no, stronger no, glasses. glasses. Doesn't need glasses. Romano doesn't. <laughs> That's the okay. Way. Not so young. Put it you now. <laughs> oh, you reach in a few years, you'll, go, you'll be like me. <laughs> I have two more cases. Case three is 46 year old male, uh, clear lens, myopic, with the inferior focal detachment and single horseshoe tear at six o'clock and macula on. 
what would you do? Scleral buckling sponge only, scleral buckling encircling band of sponge, primary vitrectomy, if you do it gas or silicone oil, or combined buckling and vitrectomy? The, the, sponge only. I do combined buckling and vitrectomy, uh, inferior buckling and a, a, a total vitrectomy. Okay. Scleral buckling. Scleral buckling, good. Let's see. Sponge. We did we did the cryo sponge and puncture. I think the uh, the puncture is important for inferior breaks, as I emphasized in my presentation. And retina was attached with the single surgery with the very good result, one zero. And the last case is sixty six years old uh, male with nuclear sclerosis, total retinal detachment, with multiple breaks in all quadrants, macula off vitreous opacities, visual acuity head movements, and good vision in the other eye. What would you do? Scleral buckling, encircling band on sponge, primary vitrectomy, gas or silicone oil, or combined encircling band vitrectomy? Primary vitrectomy. B. 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 Okay. Okay. Paco vitrectomy. It's not included. It's not, I thought of it, but it's not included. Okay, I, I, I did the uh, combined encircling band vitrectomy with gas and the uh, retina was attached with one surgery and the visual acuity. I think uh, multiple pairs are good indication if the vision in the other eye is good and then uh, retina was attached in one was surgery and visual acuity was 0.3 despite that it was hand movement before the surgery. That's uh, uh, just to remind you uh, that you can see if you want to see more videos that I showed, you can uh, read it in my book that I wrote together with my uh, colleagues and co workers, uh, Ulrich Spandau from Uppsala and Diego Ruiz Casas from Madrid. And uh, it's published by Springer and uh, taught, uh, tells about the retinal detachment and proliferative vitreoretinopathy. Thank you. Thank you, John. Amazing presentation and questions. Thank you I, so much. Can I ask two questions to the... Yeah. So the first one, so do you like to combine the... When you do you like to combine the vitrectomy with the encircling band? Because now there are a lot of papers like Viper study, Pro study that say that if we add uh, you know, the encircling band, the success rate does not uh, grow too much. So I think there are still some cases that we need it. You know, uh, you know, beside the studies, but uh, when you like, you know, to have the buckle, the circle band to the vitrectomy, I would uh, do uh, encircling band combined with vitrectomy in uh, children and high myopic patients, and uh, as well if if uh, there is an inferior long-standing retinal detachment, those are indications. In all other cases, I would do. I will, I, I will say I would do, in, uh, if we uh, uh, look at the frequency and percentage, I would do probably 80 to 90% without encircling band and 10%, 20, 10 to 20% with. Basically, when uh, you are not sure that you can induce the, the PVD until the, until, until the aura, so right. when it uh, stays in between, and uh, so this is the point. Exactly, and in, in myopic, where you have a broad insertion of the, uh, uh, the vitreous, then you risk the shortening of the retina, then the, uh, the retinotomy and the silicone oil exchange, and this is not the thing I really like. And, and another thing, um, you know, in uh, UK, mostly, because, uh, you know, I have been there for a fellowship, so they like to combine the... Um, they don't like to combine FECO with uh, uh, vitrectomy, okay? In other country, they like more to combine to, both together. Uh, I think the, the main point is when we are doing, uh, I'm doing a lot of combined surgery, but when we combine the surgery, like doing the FECO and we put silicone oil in, sometimes you have the adhesion uh, because of the inflammation, between iris uh, lens, intraocular lens, zonula, and yaloid. So sometimes we have a matter of like a malignant glaucoma, okay? So do you think that in case of uh, using uh, um, silicone oil, can we do the FECO when we remove the silicone oil? 
What do you think? Um, I think it's not a good, uh, not bad idea to do it that way. But if I uh, know that I'm going to use the silicone oil, which I usually know at the beginning of surgery, what I'm Sometimes you, you change, but mostly you know yeah. what you are planning to do. Then I do the combined surgery with the uh, 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 primary uh, posterior capsular axis. If, okay. If I, if so I, the, the point is like, uh, if I have to put silicone oil, I need still to do another surgery later on. So, I mean, uh, I can do the um, cataract when I will remove the silicone oil and I don't have this problem anymore. So this is a, a this is this is a this is a very good option, and then you can do it uh, cataract in the beginning when the R is uh, filled with silicone oil, and then mm -hmm. that's stable. You can. But what I'm doing uh, in the second surgery is ILM peeling if I use the silicone oil always, because then I can do the OCTC whether that there is some thickening of the ILM, uh, ERM or something, and then I do mostly if I do the silicone oil, I, I will do the ILM peeling. Uh, but but uh, th there is another issue. Uh, if I do the uh, combined encircling band and, and uh, 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 primary vitrectomy, I try to avoid uh, surgery of the lens because then you have a very long operation. And uh, if you use the, the idea of uh, doing combined surgery of uh, encircling band and vitrectomy is to avoid silicone oil. And if I'm going to use the gas, I'm not forced to do the cataract. I can do it afterwards if it de develops. Can I ask you? you? Sorry. Yes. Can I ask you yeah, just yes, of one more question? Uh, what about when everybody's putting gas in a fake eye? In a fake eye, when do you have this gas at the, that is pushing? The posterior capsule, and then you got a foggy cataract in the end of the operation. Uh, uh, this uh, feather cataract that you have, yes. you guys, how many times do you have that? And if it's uh, reversible or if it's something that stays there and then, but it stops you in the middle of the operation sometimes. Uh, that is true, but uh, 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 what I was trying was to, to put the uh, viscoelastic behind the lens and it sometimes it helps, but sometimes I was in the situation to, to, uh, that, that forced me to do the uh, FACO in the middle of the operation. In the middle, yes. Unfortunately. But do you think, uh, I'm talking to the panel, do you think this uh, feather, uh, the feathering of the lens because of the gas is reversible? It is. I think yes. so. It is. It is. It is going to disappear within the two days, but it might uh, might impair your vision during the operation. But if you uh, try to 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 wait, sometimes it, it it disappears during the operation as well. That is my experience. Okay. Thank you so much. We have uh, two questions from Carlos um, Mateo. Hello, Carlos. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tomic, how do you calculate IOL power in combined buckle plus uh, vitrectomy? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I always go for plus one to plus two, we, uh, so that the, the, we, we, we target the plus one or plus two because uh, the uh, uh, my encircling bands varies between minus one and minus two. And uh, to Professor Romano, uh, do you perform PVD to the aura? Uh, um, so we, we we try we try to use you know the PVD and to get the vitreous uh, mob, mobile until you know the anterior part. I mean uh, during the vitrectomy you can feel that uh, you know you got a complete vitreous detachment or not because you can see the vitreous moving. So uh, sometimes it stops in between. Uh, you know the uh, the. Uh, is not uh, so anterior, uh, you are a bit afraid, what we were saying before, that uh, in future the contraction can induce, you know, some uh, kind of, uh, um, the, of uh, retinal tear or with the uh, uh, gas or silicone oil that can have uh, more contraction of this, the vitreous space. So, but I try, of course, to induce as uh, anterior as I can. 
Thank you. And one question from uh, Zoran. When you suture next to the sleeve, do you suture both overlapping bands together or only the lower ones? Or, or only the lower one, the, the, uh, the bands, not the uh, sleeve. Thank you. Can you stop sharing? And I ask uh, our audience to vote. We have two polls. And first poll is now. You can see the question. Buckling for rheumatic genius retinal detachment. Please answer all our participants. We have 159. Uh, I do it according to indications to block the brakes, relieve the traction in, com in combination with the vitrectomy. First answer. Second one, I would do it, but I don't know how. I need to learn. And the third, I can do it, but I prefer vitrectomy for all cases. Okay. And uh, should I ask, answer this question or is it a question for all the uh, all, For all particip participants and we will see the um, result in one minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, we finished. Can I you see it? 64 yes, yes. percentage for, um, for buckling they uh, use it and 15 percentage i think it may be uh, participants uh, students for the saloniki vitro school what do you think <laughs> professor nikolakopoulos they need to uh, learn and uh, 21 percentage for uh, they prefer vitrectomy for all uh, the cases. It's interesting uh, how your opinion change after our webinar. Uh, I think in the last few years, uh, the trend for uh, square buckle is growing back. Uh, so I think uh, you know you can uh, resolve a lot of problem. You know sometimes you know, with uh, you, I think you, it's going back. It's, I think it's the time that we're living that we have to become cost effective. Nobody is talking about the cost effectiveness of the sclera buckle uh, in, in, in contrast to the vitrectomy. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't sterilize and re-sterilize everything, that we shouldn't do that. And then imagine that it's a thousand to hundred. That's the difference between buckling and vitrectomy. So uh, nobody is talking about the social economics about the buckling. But I, the buckling is going back again for one main reason. People have a chandelier light and they can use the microscope. The buckling died when people didn't know how to use the indirect ophthalmoscope to detect and do the cryo and do everything. Now with the chandelier light and the microscope, they can imitate the vitrectomy and they can have a huge magnified view of the tears and they can do sclera and everything. So I think two reasons is that we're going back to buckles. One is financial and the second is that they can do it with a chandelier if you teach them how to suture. This is the thing that they don't know. From the school, I found out they don't know how to hold a sponge in its place by its sutures. And you see that if you make one suture and then they ask the guy next to them, can you hold the suture instead to put the second one? Because they don't know basic things that uh, we got some teachers like John Skor and Ray Zivonovic who taught us how to do it correctly. So they need to have basic things in order to go to the buckles. They don't need the, 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 the big idea behind it. And you see that the companies are not promoting buckles. Nobody's showing videos with a buckle or make a meeting with a buckle. But it's amazing again that after 40 years, you know, we have no, so it's no need, the study says 
you know, is, are similar. The outcomes, the, the uh, anatomical function outcomes between the two techniques at the end are similar. So it's amazing, huh? <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. Uh, a, a recent Cochrane review by Susanna Binder in 2019 also found no difference between pars plana vitrectomy and scleral buckling in anatomical and visual acuity outcome. It's very, very interesting. It's very useful procedure. Also, I, I glad that it's, it's really come back. But there is something that is very different. The appearance of the eye post buckle surgery and post 27 or 25 gauge surgery. And this cosmetic result, it's very important for our patients when you are in a private practice uh, system, <laughs> when the patient goes out with a wide eye and they say, do you see, you don't know which one has been operated. And with the other eye, just with a cryo, you're just bulging all the leads, just with a cryo, if you do cryo. So 25 gauge and laser and vitrectomy gives you a wide eye at the end of the operation. This is another issue that we don't talk so much. But on the other hand, it it's, uh, saves you some time and troubles doing the buckling and then you decide for to do it. Uh, it's more comfortable for us to do the vitrectomy, but uh, the question is if, if it is always better for the patient. There is room for both, for sure. Yes, I think uh, still that, that there is, a, as I said, about 80 to 90 percent we can do the vitrectomy, but there is some place for those older, older teachers and surgeons were not that stupid. <laughs> were why, they? why nobody is discussing when they make the difference, the appearance of the eye. That's, that's very important. Nobody's putting it in the lectures. I agree. <laughs> Put it there. Thank you. It looks like a uh, trout case. <laughs> we, we need to continue. Please, um, Professor Nikolakopoulos, the floor is yours. I would uh, like, first of all, to thank you, uh, Tatiana. It was a beautiful uh, opportunity to learn a few things again because. Uh, uh, the first session and the second, uh, the videos that I saw were incredible. And uh, I really would like to thank, thank Ukraine for doing that for us. And uh, of course, Zoran Tomic is a value. And uh, I'm just asking you to see how is Thessaloniki where I sit now. Uh, I cannot walk in these streets because there's um, nobody's allowed to walk anymore at night. So don't come this time of the year. What is the zipper syndrome? Uh, the zipper syndrome is uh, something that I found out while doing uh, a lot of cases. And we start with the discussion of the vitreous base insertion. What's the difference? The vitreous base, the collagen fiber are especially dense. And the area that extends two millimeter anterior and three millimeter posterior to the aura serrata. This fiber are very difficult to disinsert during surgery. Everybody's talking about the vitreous base, uh, but anatomically, we have to go a little bit back and see that this is the area of the vitreous base. And the normal area, it's about four you see 1.5 to three. So it's 4.5 uh, from either side of the, uh, of the aura. Posterior insert vitreous base was defined as the insertion of the posterior hyoid membrane being located posterior to the vortex vein. This is an issue now we have to discuss that the base is not always where it's supposed to be. And when it goes, posterior to the vortex veins, it goes almost to the equator. And when you see a case like that, that we have to distinct, is that the average number of tears preoperatively in those rheumatogenic retinal detachment was 3.1. So 30% have new brace identified intraoperatively. That's why we discussed to separate this session of the zipper syndrome. And the average distance from the aura serrata to the vortex is about 7.6. And in these cases that they have been done and we have been done, we used adjunctive bascal and uh, sometimes we use uh, 360. Redetachment and proliferative vitreous retinopathy in this special uh, posterior vitreous base 
still occur despite the knowledge of uh, disorder and adjuvant treatment, but we have to know this in order to understand it. So if we would like to sum it up, what is Zipper syndrome? It's multiple tears in one meridian in a retina detachment without PVR. The tears have to be in the same plane also in the attached retina. So we have detached and attached retina, you have multiple tears. You have a posterior basis desertion, and they give the impression of a continuity that acts like a zipper that gives, given time, it can open all of them one after the other. Here I can show you a, a video of a small video while doing, and these tears you can see here are in the attached retina. It's one after the other like soldiers. So this is the attached retina that I do laser on, a, on multiple tiers that if they are connected, they can be a giant tear. And then I'm going to the retina detachment and you can see the tears in the same plane. And while I'm removing fluid from the tear, and injecting gas, you can see that there are inferiorly and anteriorly detached attached retina and they are in the same plane. You see the plane of the laser for the uh, non-detached retina and you see the plane here for the detached retina. So it's in the same plane. What is the special consideration? The vitreous saving, it's much more difficult, if impossible, and traction should be removed from all the tears, as we know from uh, the, the basics of uh, retina detachment. So these tend to have a higher detachment rate, do a tear opening, reopening. Here is a very simple, straightforward detachment that we do vitrectomy, and you can see there's a little tear here, and we try to remove the vitreous and we have removed most of it. And then we go to the uh, anterior vitreous in order to remove as much as you said before, as we mentioned, and uh, we see something a little bit funny. We see a bridge where the vitreous base should be. Now you're going to see it. You see here? Yes. It's very clear that this vitreous bridge here, it's the posterior vitreous base that cannot be cut off. You try to chew it, you try to cut it and it stays there like it is. And this is creating different, different tears in different areas, as you can see here. Here it's very, very distinct. You can see the traction, you can see everything. And you can see the folding. It's like having a vitreous attachment, a second retina on this area. We did, uh, we just tried to separate them. Uh, with, we had 26 vitrectomies. This is statistics, you don't care about this. Uh, but if it's recognized, what's the difference if we recognize that this is a zipper syndrome? A simple primary vitrectomy sometimes is not enough. Here, the 360 buckle indication is much stronger because you cannot release the traction from the tears. And 360 laser is probably something you have to consider. And C3 FA is much better than, than, uh, than anything else in gas. And you know that, uh, as Professor Makime used to say, progress comes from doing the unconventional. So we try to do this. Uh, a lot of uh, you would know that we try to have a course in Thessaloniki teaching them how to suture buckles, how to do that. And we always say that before you start anything, learn how to finish it. And this co-organization of this teaching vitreo retina section was done with uh, primary with Cesare Forlini, the late Cesare Forlini, who I always mention since he is my brother and my dead brother. And uh, we used by Bionico artificial eyes in training. 
and we used to show handshake technique in 3D. And a lot of important uh, fellows, uh, and you're invited also if we come out of this pandemic, uh, that they come and teach uh, uh, their experience. And the setup, uh, including uh, Dork, that it's helping us a lot. We have all 3D cameras, Ingenuity, and all this stuff. And uh, we're supposed to have one to, in June this year. And uh, it's open to youth, uh, as you can see. And uh, this is uh, what I would like to show you for the presentation of. Uh, Thank you so much. Of the Zipper syndrome. And uh, if we can stay there for a while, uh, the next is going to be just a video of. Uh, unexpected results. So if you like to stay in the first. Uh, no, 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 please. Would you like to continue? Of course. OK, we have a, a we are specialized with retinal surgeons are specialized in uh, in doing cataract complications. So they asked me to go uh, because one of our, our surgeons had dropped the nucleus. So this is how we start up. I'm always using 23 gates for a drop nucleus. And I'm using always a chandelier light for bimanual surgery. And and I found myself taking the eye first to see the pressure. The infusion was on, and I tried not to leak. And then I went it for the nucleus. And what do I see? I see a bullous retinal detachment and no nucleus. I'm looking all over the eye. This is a 87 year old guy. Who's behind? The, where's, where's, the, where's the nucleus? Behind the radio. Yeah, yeah you are experienced to that. <laughs> Here we found the tear that it was made by pulling and pushing and the funny thing is that was big enough and we have a glimpse that something was but the lens was not at the tear side this is temporal this is the lens we have to suck it out with the flute needle with the long and try to make active uh, aspiration and you can see the birth of a nucleus And it's not a small one. It's a big and a very hard one. You can see it. Yeah. Uh, so it was a, a, a subretinal nucleus on the other side of the bullous detachment. And now you have a small problem. You don't like to open this eye to remove it by. You don't want to inject perfluorocarbon in the eye. Because if you inject perfluorocarbon, it's a hundred percent that it's going to go through the large tear at the back of the eye, and you want to remove this lens. And I have a few take-home messages. First of all, from our experiences, you should never touch or push anything that is sitting on the retina. So if it's pieces of lens, nucleus, you have to lift it in the middle of the vitreous and then do whatever you like to do. You'd like to emulsify it, you'd like to cut it to pieces. And it's always by manual with a chandelier light because one hand is helping the other. But this is a very, very strong one. And now we try to use a, something like chopping technique. I'm going to get a little bit faster. I'm using phaco fragmentation. The other hand is very helpful because it's holding the lens while you're doing FECO to do it continuously without letting fragments or the whole thing dropping back and forth, which is not damaging the eye anyway, because when you drop pieces on the surface of the retina, you don't do any damage. But if you try to touch anything that's sitting on the retina, then you're going to be in trouble. You're going to make a tear because the retina is like, as my 
my my friend used to say, uh, Riemann used to say that the, the retina is like sometimes in these cases, uh, like a wet toilet paper. So you shouldn't touch it. And we do everything in the middle. And also we have to avoid hitting the detached retina or cutting the detached retina. So this is, uh, And at the end, still using 23 gates, we're using the force feeding method. I'm just going a little bit faster. You see at the end, we just try to make some pieces and remnants. Remember, remember it's a very hard nucleus. And that's, the force feeding that I'm going to tell you is that you need another hand for that. And you shouldn't look for it, it's going to come and then you push it and then you eat it. And then we put some gas inside the eye and uh, we do some vitrectomy, dry vitrectomy and then we just taking out the subretinal fluid and put some gas and do some laser. Uh, and another issue is what he has a deskimate detachment. So if you have a cataract surgeon and we have to suture the deskimate, if you get a cataract surgeon who is fighting to save the nucleus, the biggest damage in eyes are happening while trying to save the nucleus. So if you have a nucleus problem, then the best thing to do is to uh, uh, leave it as it is and do all the, all the surgery anteriorly to the... We have a question. Would you add a bubble of perfluorocarbon on the macula, macula to protect it from possible damage due to dropping of the lens or its fragments? We can't see and hear you, Professor Nikolakopoulos. You cannot see me, it's not yeah. bad. You cannot hear me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's bad, no. please. <laughs> okay, I have to switch on the share screen or the video or whatever it is. Yes, okay. Uh, the issue of perfluorocarbon protecting the macula when you're cutting a, a, a nucleus in pieces, is that uh, perfluorocarbon is supposed to stay at the surface of the retina and pieces should stay at the, at the top of perfluorocarbon. As soon as you start vitrectomy in order to remove them, then you have a turbulence in the eye. And this turbulence is taking the perfluorocarbon on the top of what you try to remove. And instead of saving it like a below on the back, protecting it, you have it on the top, pressing it against the retina. And the heavy liquid pressing against with multiple uh, pieces, pressing against the retina can do damage. So for me, perfluorocarbon should not be used for dropped things like nucleus that lend that IOL. The nicest thing you can do is to use by manual surgery always, and use different techniques, like for example, the fluid needle energetic suction with one hand in order to hold it in the middle and work with the other hand, if you want to have a, a endofaco. And if you want to just chop and cut them, you have to use the right hand forceps, not the right hand vitrectomy, and the left hand vitrectomy, use 650 suction, lift the pieces of the lens in the middle as you show me doing, and then with the right hand, crush it at the tip and take them little by little. It doesn't take such a long time as you think, but perfluorocarbon protecting, you have to remember that you cannot, it's like a slippery dome. As soon as you start turbulence, it's going to go above the, 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 the lens or above everything that you have. And everything should be done in the middle of the eye. You should not touch anything that's sitting on the top of the retina. You should not go and grab it. You should remove it first and then grab it. Thank you. When you have a very posterior vitreous base, how do you reach it 
when it is not possible to pray the sclera so far back? I'm just cutting as far as there, you can see. I'm removing the vitreous as far as I can go, and then I put a buckle for 360 degrees of laser in order to support it, because there's no way to remove it. It's so thick and so embedded. Because you have to remember that the vitreous base is not only inside the retina, it's inside the vitreous. It goes both ways. And it's uh, millimeters inside the vitreous. So sometimes this kind of vitreous base, you cannot, be, you cannot remove it. With minimum vacuum and uh, shaving? Well, uh, if you saw the video, yeah. With a very nice cutting machine, I was chewing it without cutting it. So we don't have strong instruments. Can I, can I ask, um, you know, now the high, you know, the, the cut rate frequency is very high, but uh, I still think that, you know, the pump uh, make uh, the difference. So do you believe that the flow control still for the shaving in periphery, you know, makes difference instead to have just a vacuum control. So like, uh, you know, a peristaltic pump uh, can still work better than a venturi pump in periphery, even if we have uh, now this high cut rate. What do you think? Welcome, Didier. Uh, do you know Didier de Cournot? Yeah. <laughs> and now is the, the the cut rate is even much more, but still I think uh, you know there's a difference. No, the thing is that I don't think it makes such a big difference the flow control, which is, and the, 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 the difference was peristaltic is peristaltic understand when it's hard and when it's soft. Venturi doesn't understand that, but peristaltic you have to go and grab it. It doesn't work from far away from that. So uh, if I have the control in my foot, well, I'm doing how much I press it. So I'm putting 650 vacuum on top, mm -hmm. but I'm using as much vacuum as I think it's required. Mm -hmm. And cutting rate, it's very high when you don't want to pull, but it, it, the thing is that you want to control it with your footstep and from a little far away. And the other thing that is helping it to overcome this is clearer depression. If you use it chandelier light with a scleral depressure, you can remove all the uh, traction from the other side so you can work much freely. As in the first video, uh, uh, Adril showed us beautifully how you can remove the mobility of the retina by scleral depression and you have a stable retina, then you work and remove it. Uh, you don't have a floating thing in front of you. Uh, I think there is a place for flow rate and now I think the machines that they come now, they have both systems, but you have to understand the mechanics and the physics are not changing. Uh, you can change the machine, but not the physics. So the physics tell me that I need to work a little bit further away with the scleral depression and I prefer uh, the, 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 this, but I don't, I have nothing against the flow control or flow rate and it's slower. But much lower. Thank you. We have uh, one more question. Do you routinely cool the phaco probe with BSS outside the eye while fragmenting the cataract to protect the eye wall from thermal damage? Yeah, if you have the phaco fragment, the end of phaco fragmentator that we're using now, and you uh, actually don't use it, you, you don't press it the pedal down uh, all the time instead of using it, but only when you have something in the tip of it. That's why you're using the other hand in order to control the lens to be at the tip of the FACO fragmentator. Then with z z different zaps like that, one, two, three, one, two, three, to eat only what something. We never had any problem with thermal energy. We never wet the A from the outside. And we had something we published something at 250 cases with or without thermal energy. So uh, we haven't seen anything like that. With a modern uh, 19 gauge, 20 gauge uh, phaco fragmentate, endophaco. And another issue is if, if you see my video, I didn't go because it's bigger than the 23 gauge uh, trockers. 
I just stab the eye in and I don't remove the trocker and put the this because I need the trocker for, for the rest of the operation. So I make another hole in order to use that. Was it 20 gauge? Well, 19 to 20, I think 20 gauge, yes. Now, now they have something like 22, 23 gauge, uh, some machines, but not, not Constellation. I'm using Constellation system. And uh, I don't have Dork. The new Eva Dork has both. I think you can have, uh, 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 the most important thing about this is uh, uh, wide angle system that you're using in order to have uh, the beautiful view that we have with Andril. I have to, I was impressed by your videos, the beautiful video we have, uh, the wide angle you can control. And the other thing is uh, very important is to have the chandelier light, the extra light. And this, especially with the dark light that can go in and out as much as you like. And uh, it's about until 30 degrees. The ANSI lumen that they're using now for the chandelier lights are much higher than 10 years ago, the probe that we have. We used to have five ANSI lumen and now they go to 20 ANSI lumen. So you have beautiful illumination, very wide angle. You can sit and operate. So Archimedes used to say, give me a place to sit and look and I can move the earth. So uh, things are much easier for the young generation because they can see and they can control. And surgery is control. Thank you so much. We have one comment. Congratulations for great presentation to my teacher, Zoran and Tanasi, Vlada. <laughs> From Vlada to you. Vlada. I would like to continue and share with you uh, my presentation. It's about... Uh, manipulations can you see my uh, presentation yes okay um, i would like to talk about uh, two cases and after that to ask your uh, way your approach questions um, the um, situation is uh, about retinal detachment with aperitoneal fibrosis and I uh, think this um, fibrosis was before uh, detachment so we uh, see the situation with uh, combined with two problems and questions are how to stain uh, staining on the mobile retina or on the PSL and how to remove epiretinal tissue under the PFCL or without. And I would like to uh, show you my uh, video. Uh, this patient um, had retinal detachment during um, more than one month. And after COVID rectomy, we uh, put the PFCL and uh, continue on the periphery with scleral depression, with uh, shaving the base and periphery. And I prefer to stain under the uh, PFCL. Um, in, um, I, I uh, remove the epiretinal tissue and I can do it uh, carefully. The retina is uh, attached under the PSL and my actions are horizontally and um, of course um, there is some, uh, some weight of PSL but I can control uh, the removing without any damage, without any heterogenic uh, breaks on the periphery if I uh, would do it without PFCL. After first layer, uh, without additional staining, uh, I still see uh, the blue tissue very clearly. I removed uh, ILM and after that uh, routinely I uh, do 
air fluid exchange, and uh, the surgery was finished by silicon oil tamponade. Um, I will continue and ask you after my presentation. Uh, the next, um, the follow up uh, picture was good. Visual acuity was 0 0.2, and in two months we removed silicone oil and uh, visual acuity was increased um, to 0 0.4. You can see the OCT picture, uh, the uh, outer layer. Uh, also uh, began to restoration. And uh, the case uh, number two is about how to put silicone oil. Uh, routinely, we uh, do uh, in direct way air fluid exchange. We put silicone oil into the dried cavity, vitreous cavity. And in some cases, to avoid uh, the um, slippage, we can use uh, direct way to put silicone oil uh, just into the PSL uh, liquid. And here's my case with a uh, young uh, guy, 28 years old. He had blunt injury and came us in several months after, after retinal detachment. Uh, I saw some shining in the macula, so decided to see uh, if there are any fibrosis, but it was not. You can see giant tear. And after uh, the shaving and uh, removing vitros, I decided to put, uh, to put PFCL um, to attach whole uh, retina and do uh, in the laser under the PFCL. And after that, uh, I decided to put air and uh, I hold my extrusion cannula after the, under the, um, uh, the fluid PFCL interface uh, just over bare retinal pigment epithelium. And I stay uh, here during several minutes to dry this um, surface. But when uh, I saw, I, I, I saw that uh, the retina was displaced uh, posteriorly. You can see these uh, laser spots. And I decided to put to fill the PFCL and to put silicone oil just uh, into the PFCL liquid. Uh, we save the lens for this patient. So this picture is about uh, this um, growth because it was a very young patient. And uh, his, his retina was attached and we, he has, uh, he had very poor visual acuity because of uh, long-standing uh, retinal detachment and atrophy of uh, outer layers. In uh, one and a half months, we removed silicon oil and now his visual acuity uh, was increased. Thank you for your attention. And the questions is, uh, are the same. Uh, can I ask you and give a quick answer? Uh, how do you prefer to stain and remove epiretinal tissue? And comments about uh, direct way of silicone putting, Dr. Ruban, please. I would like to die before PSL injection. And I like indirect uh, PSL uh, silicon exchange because from a chemical point of view, the redu to reduce the chance for silicon oil emulsification, we should avoid direct PFCL silicon exchange. Uh, as complete removal PFCL would be advisable before silicon oil is injected. And I agree with you completely that in indirect exchange has a risk of retinal slippage in case with the giant retinal tears. In, in such cases, direct exchange, it will be uh, preferred better. Thank you. 
Dr. Tomic. Yes, uh, about the staining, I always stain under the air in uh, if retinal detachment. I, I try to attach the retina uh, with the aspiration of subretinal fluid to the, uh, through the uh, tear, and then I do the staining. And uh, if I decide to, to do peeling, sometimes I do it under perfluorocarbon, sometimes without. For me, it's the, almost the same, but it depends on the situation. It's a little bit more, more uh, uh, elegant and uh, easier to do it under the per perfluorocarbon. And about the uh, 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 fluid uh, silicon oil exchange, I'll always go over the uh, air because uh, of the dynamic, because the uh, uh, if you go directly from uh, fluid to silicon oil, silicon oil is uh, is uh, uh, lighter, easier than than uh, water, and then the the redetachment will occur. If you press the uh, air, the the sil the air is lighter than silicon oil, and it goes down. That's what we everybody knows. But uh, in the case of re giant retinal tear, I go for direct uh, silicon uh, uh, fluid silicon oil exchange because of the slippage. There is always, especially if the the, the larger the giant tear, the, the higher the risk for slippage of the retina. Thank you. What's your way, Dr. Romano? Same consideration. So I go through the air first, and then uh, inject the you know the tamponades. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, just when we need uh, to avoid slippage, so I'm going directly to it. And uh, so in my presentation, we speak about some interaction that uh, you know still says that it's much better to go to the air first instead, of, you know, to make contact between two different compounds like PFCL and oil. Thank you. Um, what's your approach, Professor Nikolakopoulos? You are in unmute. Do your mic on. Okay. Uh, I, I try to use air first, flatten the retina through the tear do some air injection and then I used to put to dye the eye in order to peel it and leave it there for a few minutes in order to be absorbed in order to be pushed by the air but as I, I, I was really afraid to use perfluorocarbon behind the perfluorocarbon to use dye because I thought that the, that the dye can go into the into the areas next left and right and it can dim the, the visual and I saw your video now, and I will try to do it with perfluorocarbon. It looks much better with perfluorocarbon. I, I, you changed my mind on that. And uh, the, the, the direct um, gas and, uh, uh, and uh, perfluorocarbon and silicon oil, uh, I'm using a technique that is not so familiar to people. Uh, my machine has a, a, a foot pedal and has a system that it says extrusion and injection together. So my foot pedal, when it goes half the way in the middle, is injecting silicon oil, while the eye is filled with perfluoroctane that I'm only using. So when I go further down, and I have in my other hand a fluid needle inside perfluorocarbon, so I'm injecting silicon oil and removing perfluorocarbon simultaneously by pressing the foot pedal to the end. The infusion cannula with a, a fluid injection inside is still on with 20 millimeters. And you know why is that? Because sometimes the equilibrium is not so correct and you need to have a filled eye, you don't have that. So with this, if you see that the eye is soft, you press only half the way the pedal and you inject only silicon oil. If you see that the eye is hard, you press it all the way down and you mechanically extrude perfluorocarbon. So you have a balance between those two in front of your eyes and you can feel it completely. And at the end, you remove the perfluorocarbon underneath. Uh, and you cannot overfill the eye with silicon oil this way because you control it. Uh, and I'm using it several in PVR cases and in giant tests. In all the other cases that it's comfortable for me, uh, if, if I want to go from gas to silicon oil, it's much easier. And it looks, 
I'm happier if I can do it quickly like that. But in cases with PVR and giant tears, I'm using this double foot pedal technique uh, that it needs chandelier light. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Mr. Romano, the floor is yours, please, your presentation. Yeah, okay. So this is a, a recurrent retina attachment associated to full thickness macula hole. So, um, okay. So the patient was already operated, the vitrectomy was already done, uh, and then he went back with this uh, recurrent retina attachment. You can see we are testing if the retina is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, free of traction or not. And uh, then I want to, first of all, uh, um, you know, uh, inject dye, but I prefer to go through the air first because I don't like to have too much uh, blue behind. The retina, and they wanna, I don't want to inject perfluorocarbolibrid because uh, the retina is not mobile, so the, also the perfluorocarbolibrid can go behind. Because the air is in interfacial tension of 70 millinewton meter, so uh, injecting air first, the, the amount of fluid that we go through will be less. And then I'm starting without putting perfluorocarbolibrid because still uh, I am not happy to have perforated carbolibrid during this maneuver because uh, probably some of, of uh, the perfor can go through. The hole is quite big uh, and uh, the retina, you know, uh, is, is a very strong addition with the, the membrane. So um, after the peeling, I want to close in somehow this hole. And uh, you see the, the hole is quite big. <clears throat> so we are putting, uh, um, I was putting uh, um, human amniotic membrane. It was dry as much as I can. And I was putting just as a plug. So you know that when you have a macro hole, you have an estromal side and, um, of, the, of the human amniotic membrane that you put towards the pigment epithelium because it's sticky and stays there and the epithelium towards the retina. In this case, uh, I was not caring at all. <coughs> I wanted just to get the plug. So we were placing under air. So the advantage is placing under air uh, is that uh, you don't need uh, uh, perforated carbon liquid. Uh, you don't need to open it because otherwise we are doing under BSS. But we wanted just to place a plug, a scaffold to help to close the, the, the hole. And you can see there is a, still a fluid behind the retina, but uh, you will see later on that uh, the plug was working because the day after the retina was uh, attached and was dry and the plug was working. Um, so now we, we are injecting silicon oil and uh, of course uh, the plug stays there. And uh, now there are uh, you know, several publications on uh, human amniotic membrane and uh, uh, macro hole and also retinal attachment. And uh, now you will see, this is, we are still you know, at the end of operation with silicon oil in. And uh, um, uh, this is, there was the one day after, you know, there was a nice plug, the retina was attached, it was dry. And so the patient it still at least was happy that uh, the, the, there was no detachment anymore. And um, uh, of course, the visual recovery was not so high, was 0 0.1, but uh, uh, that was a, a recurrent rate in attachment with a very poor prognosis. So if you like, uh, I will uh, do the presentation first. Yes. And then we can speak about, you know, the bot. So. So my presentation will be about the interaction between different compounds in vitro retinal surgery. And uh, I need to acknowledge the two labs that are working with us. One is in Milan, one is in Genoa. And uh, so we routinely use liquid as a surgical device, but uh, what uh, are our concerns while using liquid device, like dyes, perforated carbon liquid, silicon oil? 
So um, what do we think that we, there's a still lack of information about the mechanical damage that we may use, the composition of, of single devices, and the chemical interaction between intraocular compounds, because at the end, the function outcomes are related to the surgery, to the surgeon, to the disease, but also to all the compounds that we are using during the surgery. So do you believe that these findings are related only to the use of silicon oil? So we can, so we can see this emulsion, creaming, there was a traumatic retina attachment, but uh, you, you think that emulsion is just a matter of silicon oil. We think that is a combination, the biocompatibility of, of several things. And also look, this uh, heavy silicon oil it was a, a 59 years old inferior in attachment treated with heavy silicon oil. And you can see this inflammation eight weeks after. And during the removal of heavy silicon oil, the liquid uh, fall down from the infusion during the air fluid exchange. And uh, the retina was so weak that we had two big retinal tests just because of the fluid fall down. And look, this uh, is a 79 years old that was treated with the silicon oil. Then we removed the silicon oil and you can see these uh, white dots uh, on the retinal surface. It was not laser, it was uh, a uh, inflammation related to the silicon oil and it was all around the eye. And look, this other one, we are trying to collect the cases uh, of toxicity. Um, and uh, I will show you, you know, a few papers about these things. So look at this case that is a macula off retinal attachment was treated with uh, uh, vitrectomy, perforate carboliquid, transilinum and blue during the surgery. And then at the end, the, the retina is attached, but there's something in between the retina, retinal pigment epithelium. And you can see at the um, fundus out of fluorescence, there is a, you know, some damage of retinal pigment epithelium with the hyper and hypo out of fluorescence. So, um, of course, uh, it's very difficult to find the guilty of this picture, but it's for sure there's some interaction. And stick on, stick on that you already mentioned is another problem related to the interaction between different compounds that we are using during the search. So the point is the single compound is safe because to be on the market, uh, uh, they had, uh, of course, you know, the uh, uh, control of uh, ISO and uh, several other controls, but uh, nobody is uh, thinking about the interaction between them. So the single compound is safe, but the interaction we think that are not safe. So we need to identify the players of this system and which one, which one we can control between all these different things. So let's go a step back, perforate carbon liquid. You know that uh, when, so we were measuring the intra, the real intraocular pressure when we are injecting fluid and when we are doing indentation. This is a big eye, the, the, uh, the real one. And you can see when we inject uh, blue or when we inject uh, 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 perforate carbon liquid, the pressure inside the eye goes up to 200, 300 millimeters of mercury. And when you do skirt indentation, it goes up to 200 millimeters of mercury. So there is a lot of fluctuation of pressure. But uh, so far, nobody cares about this fluctuation. Nobody knows if the, we have a damage related also to this uh, you know, uh, shift of pressure. And uh, you for sure know that uh, in, uh, in Spain, but also in many other countries uh, in 2016-17, they had an issue related to the use of perforate carbon liquid. And uh, the day after of using it, they had pale optic nerve retinal necrosis, destruction of all layers. The paper published 115, 17 cases, but there are so many others described around the world. The problem was rated perforate carbon liquid and uh, the Alamedics uh, was the manufacturer that uh, exhibited a certification of safety based, based on a strict cytotoxicity test. And they said, uh, you know, our product is not cytotoxic, but then uh, Pasteur did the, say, the experiment using a different uh, test, direct contact cytotoxicity test with the same rule ISO 10993 and said that the, the product was cytotoxic. 
So the, the first problem is, are the ISO criteria adequate to the deck cytotoxicity? So we you know, try to analyze, to validate the cytotoxicity test according to the ISO. We published this paper and we did this risk assessment and experimental design, looking at the sensibility, the evaporation, the contact of the samples the uh, contact area, contact time, and uh, cell mortality induced by the pressure. And what we found at the end, that uh, the ISO criteria are adequate to the deck cytotoxicity, but uh, Alamedic chose the wrong testing method that was the extract test, where the, the right one was the direct test. The problem is that according to the ISO, you need to choose the test that you think is better for the condition where the uh, compound will work. So basically they choose the wrong one, but at the end the, the product was cytotoxic. The second problem is why did the, the toxicity was not detected? And so we answered this question because the, they choose the wrong method. And the third one is the H value can predictive of a cytotoxicity. We wrote another paper where we found that the low high H content is, cannot predict of a cytotoxicity because there are some compounds with, with the low content of, of uh, H uh, value, but still are cytotoxic, while other with the high H value are not cytotoxic. So we want to say, just because from the companies, we want both biological and chemical tests, uh, just to be sure that we are using a product that is not cytotoxic. So it's not just a matter of chemical, but also a biological test. And what about the silicon oil? So we believe that it's safe, but we know that the, poly, the silicon oil is obtained by three steps in thesis. One is the polymerization, and during the polymerization reaction are also generated uh, um, impurity that are just a matter of dimension of mo molecules. So are generated also low molecular weights component and silanol. And uh, according to the European Chemical Agency, since June 2018, the low molecular weights component are included in the candidate list of substances of very high concern. So what we wanted to do is just to uh, compare the, the concentration low molecular weights component in 10 different brands of silicon oil that are on the market. So basically with the chromatography, we compared the area under the tail on the left of the curve. So the short chain components. And what we found in, in this paper that we published that there is a big difference between the concentration low molecular weights component in different silicon oil on the market. Of course, uh, um, you know, also Joachim Dresk wrote uh, an, an editorial saying that the manufacturer should communicate the purity and the quality characteristic of their product in understable and clear manner. But regarding silicon oil, we cannot say that the low molecular weight are uh, cytotoxic, are not cytotoxic. This is just a trend uh, of uh, cell viability uh, more than 70%, but are not cytotoxic. The problem, as you can see also in this, uh, uh, in this uh, assessment, but uh, the problem is that when we have a low molecular weight component in the silicon oil, the speculation is that the, the low molecular weight component diffuses out of the oil into the ocular tissue inducing a chronic toxicity. So that can accumulate in the environment and it can cause unpredictable effect in the long term, even when we remove the silicon oil because we will leave some low molecular weight component already in the tissue. And the last uh, thing is about the interaction. And uh, we need to keep in mind that the surfactants are compounded that lower the interfacial tension between two liquids. And one, um, one surfactant is the low molecular weight component. And when we change the interfacial tension, we can, we can get the silicon oil emulsion and we can get inflammation. So we need to look for the surfactants. The picture that I showed you at the beginning, uh, you know, like cream, it was not just related to the silicon oil, but was related to the surfactants that are on the silicon oil. 
and can we produce during the surgery? So for this reason, we added the biosurfactant, so the proteins that we are producing during the surgery to the silicon oil. And what we found that uh, uh, adding just albumin that is present in a physiological serum content, we found that we have a reduction of 50% of the inter interfacial tension. So that means if the interfacial tension of our silicon oil is 40 millinewton meters, it becomes 20. So that means uh, it's more prone to be emulsified. So also our surgery and the disease make difference. So we need to do the surgery and to be as clean as we can because we produce less surfactants. And then if we are using triamcinolone, Tiasimon, we found that uh, does not change interfacial tension of silicon oil, but uh, if we leave triamcinolone with silicon oil, we have this uh, pickering emulsion. That means that uh, the emulsion can get stable. You, we can have like a solidification, like a creaming of the emulsion if we leave uh, triamcinolone with silicon oil. We need also to think that uh, these are just preliminary results. In lab, if we add the triamcinolone to decaline, the cytotoxicity increases a lot. So it's below the threshold of 70%. So, so it is cytotoxic, canacord plus decaline. And then regarding heavy silicon oil, we need to remember that F6, H8, and also F4, H5 are very close to the third shoulder of cytotoxicity. But we are mixing with the silicon oil in heavy silicon oil. And this is the reason why now we are adding uh, uh, silicon oil that are more uh, molecular, molecular weights that is uh, longer, higher, because the biological interaction depends also on the length of silicon oil. So longer chain can trap better the reactive substance that are F6H8 and F4H5. So the alkane semifluorinate can induce uh, sticky oil, as you mentioned. And we published this paper that uh, even after fluid air exchange, if you do the gas chromatography on the bubble on small liquid that you can still see on the disc after a fluid exchange, if you wait for a while, you still can see some fluid. There are the spike of decaline, the same spike at gas chromatography of the, of the perform that we have been used. So basically, we leave still perform carbon liquid even if we do fluid air exchange. And then in the lab, we added the heavy silicon oil and we have this, heavy, this sticky, oil, sticky oil. So sticky oil, we found that it's not just a matter to be sticky, but it's also hyper viscous. And uh, with the sticky oil uh, is more with the octane and the caline because octane has a high spreading coefficient and uh, uh, it's very difficult, uh, you know, that uh, we can uh, um, dissolve. So we tried several things. One is also the temperature. Changing the temperature, you can also change the, uh, the, the uh, saturation of heavy silicon oil with perfluorocarbonate. Still, we need to avoid the direct oil perfluor exchange, as we mentioned before. So uh, concluding, we can say that uh, uh, injection of fluid uh, increases the intercooler pressure. So we need to do several, uh, we can speak later, uh, several maneuvers to avoid it. Perfluor carbon liquid is safe, but it needs to be correctly tested because it can be very reactive. Silicon oil interaction are dangerous. Proteins can lower the interfacial tension. Triancinolone is, uh, does not change interfacial tension, but be careful using with the preferred carbon liquid. And the F6, H8, and preferred carbon liquid uh, is better to don't stay in contact with each other. Thank you very much. Romano, fantastic scientific work, really. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Can I ask you, Armana? Yeah, yeah. Mario, it's a beautiful presentation. It's, I agree with you completely that we, it's very important to know how interact silicon oil with envelopment in eye. And uh, we also published some paper where demonstrated uh, change in adhesive properties and optical characteristics silicon oil due to the formation of solid silicon microcrystal, it's so-called 
solidification as a result of interfection, interaction between the silicon phase and the biopolymer solution. It's very interesting topic, which uh, can uh, give the answer about uh, emulsification of silicon oil. Uh, at present, the lower, uh, we know as the lower the viscosity of the silicon oil is, is the higher the emulsification rate. Uh, even uh, Ingrid Scott and uh, Harry Flynn in uh, comparative study after retron detachment repair using uh, 1,000 Santistock silicon versus 5,000 Santistock silicon found similar results in silicon oil emulsification in two groups. And uh, also very important to, to, to protect from inflammation and uh, blood, especially red blood. Uh, but uh, interesting for me, when I ask Professor Stanislav Rizzo, uh, what is his opinion? What is the greatest risk factor for development of emulsification? And he answered, Sajan, and uh, then added, and the Sajan's parents. It's maybe also a good point. Yeah. <laughs> So, because what, what, what is your opinion? What is the greatest risk factor for emulsification? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the biosurfactant, so what the disease in the surgeon can produce is important for sure. But that kind of things you can see in, uh, um, in just in a few weeks, because if you get emulsified, you already can see some. I very, I'm very concerned regarding the silicon oil about the low molecular weight component because uh, can diffuse out from the oil to the tissue, okay? And uh, you, know, you can have a matter of chronic toxicity. Just an example, when you see the optic disc after removal of, ABC of silicon oil is not the same that it was before. So you have uh, a... Yeah, so it's a, it's a matter of uh, pallor, something you know, that uh, you can understand that probably there was uh, some interaction with these low molecular weights and, and uh, uh, the disc. And of course, also with the retina, the, this has been described also that the silicon oil can go up to the brain. So I think uh, some low molecular weights will diffuse uh, for sure in the tissue. So that's why uh, it is uh, important uh, to see, to use also compound with low concentration with uh, less impurity, because uh, sometimes it's underestimated the problem that it can have the patient even after removal. And this I, is the, the safer compound, the silicon oil. Then we have a perfluorocarbon liquid, uh, we have uh, blue, we have uh, many things that uh, TransCino, we are using so many things together. Uh, uh, 2004, if I don't uh, remember correctly, correctly uh, Bill Aylward and Danny Gregor reported some uh, cases with unexplainable loss of vision after silicon oil tamponate and extraction. Did you see any cases in your practice? Uh, really, this is a, this is a, the reason why we uh, I did my fellowship with David Wong, so this is the reason why we started, you know, to stay very close uh, to this problem because uh, we we ca we didn't answer to the this question why when you remove the silicon oil sometimes in patients that you can see very well after removal they cannot see well anymore. And uh, so there are some, uh, uh, you know, uh, theory about the you know, equilibrium between sodium, uh, potassium, many things, that, but uh, still we don't know the answer. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we've had the same question from Carlos Mateo about uh, losing vision after silicone oil. And um, do we have any more questions? Oh, Dr. Romano. Probably it's a matter of uh, some diffusion of uh, you know, these uh, components in the tissue, but uh, we still are working on, uh, but uh, we have no answer. I have a proposition for Dr. Romano. Hmm. Uh, the proposition is not uh, that you have to do uh, a, a meeting yourself that is going to give us every component that we're using what is the best way of avoiding troubles because we don't know 
the chemical aspects. On the other hand, we know very well that uh, the surgeon plays an important role of how he's using this. For example, if you do a lot of mechanical damage on the surface of the retina and then you inject something, you have a bowl of silicon oil scratching against a surface that is not uh, flow. Uh, how much silicon oil you're going to put? What is going to be the effect of a complete fill of or, or an underfill which the silicon oil is moving freely? And what is about why the 1,000 centistokes has to be removed very early and 5,700 can be removed after one year? So uh, I'm like a shoemaker. You are a scientist and I'm a shoemaker. Mm -hmm. I need to know exactly what I'm doing from the chemical point because I'm a clinician. I don't have the, 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 the aspect of doing that. So I, I think we need the specialist that we're doing that. We need to have your comments uh, and uh, collect people like yourself that they are investigating, really investigating, not super flow or something like that, to have a session that you can get us around and we can ask questions and we can give us direction because of the, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, uh, we cannot stop using them. Yeah, sure. You so, have a suggestion the, the, not to use them. Give, you must have a suggestion what is the best way of using them. The, just to give you an idea, now I'm trying to do, so we are publishing a, we are publishing a paper where we are trying to do a clean surgery, okay, in a eye, model eye with the human retina from donor, okay, and another one, the, not a clear surgery, clean surgery, so it means we can leave a bit of blue, a bit of triamcinolone, and then we have tested both uh, on the uh, basis of ISO rules, and we found that the toxicity is so high when you are not using the, you are not cleaning the surgery, that is amazing. So that means really we can make a difference if we leave a bit of, you know, compounds there and, uh, you know, we are not clean enough to remove all the blue that we can on the, all the, the compounds that we have been using. So, um, and then um, I think is uh, something that we are, is not well explored and explained to us. And so that is the reason why we need to, you know, so because also as a company, if I want to sell you know, one compound, I will test the, just that one. I'm not testing the interaction with the other compounds they are not mine. And, but we are using in the surgery several compounds. And uh, so uh, this uh, the interaction, nobody knows. Cesare Follini used to make a meeting mm -hmm. about a cocktail. And he was promoting this meeting. You were a student then promoting this meeting with a glass that has on top perfluorocarbon, <laughs> silicon oil, heavy silicon oil, and all that stuff. And it's a it, it started with spaghetti technique <laughs> and then with uh, Parmigiano, Reggiano, that was the um, Sinolon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I remember that. So please, we're asking you, you are the only one that I know. Too kind. <laughs> that you, you're doing this kind of investigation Please gather us all around and give us technical details. I'm not going to stay in the lab looking at the <laughs> motions. For example, I always leave a little bit of triamcinolone at the end of the operation in order for the macula to get less edema, which I was doing a bad thing and I didn't know that until today. Triamcinolone is quite, uh, but uh, I know we, we need to, um, yeah, be sure about you know many things, uh, and but we are going step by step publishing these uh, papers. And, uh, so. Sir, for stupid. For it will be a pleasure to help you to organize this lecture if you want. Yes, uh, I, I would like to make a comment. Uh, nice presentation, Mario. Very well, very, very important and very nice presentation. And uh, you just remind me on the problem that we had uh, as well with this. Uh, uh, unexpected uh, unexplained the visual loss after silicon oil removal i think the one thing that we can do we cannot change the structure of the silicon oil but we can what we can do is the shorten the time for the silicon oil removal and i have shortened my time for two months 
And since I did it, I, I saw the less complications of the, I think if, if the duration is shorter then the, the toxicity uh, it becomes uh, uh, less obvious. And then the other th thing is that's the, what I mentioned in my presentations. I, I tried to move back to uh, some uh, encircling band and so on to, to uh, avoid silicon oil as a tamponade for uh, uh, uncomplicated rheumatogenous retinal detachment. What do you say about this? Yeah, for sure. So we are trying to use gas as much as we can instead of, of silicon oil. And uh, silicon oil, if we can, uh, I mean, uh, remove as soon as possible, uh, you know, the amount of, uh, you know, uh, interaction and the low molecular weights that can go into the tissue will be less. So for sure, I don't like too much heavy silicon oil uh, because uh, I mean, uh, we don't know really when uh, is more reactive. So even if we do a clean surgery, sometimes it's very good, it's perfect. And some other times, uh, you know, the every bad inflammation. So, um, because the problem that the F6HA H8 uh, is uh, a very reactive, so it's like leaving a perforate carbon liquid. So, um, I don't like too much. Now, you know, the, the only one we can say the, the brand, because the only one that is producing is Dentron. Now, we are going, uh, they have Dentron Extra. Uh, just uh, is uh, a longer, uh, you know, chain, okay, that can trap better the F6H8, but it's still there. So um... uh, for for the sticky for the sticky perfluorocarbon and silicon oil, I'm using perfluorocarbon. Perfluorocarbon because uh, then uh, you know you can uh, um, uh, mix them and take it out. Yeah, uh, or uh, uh, if you do a fluid exchange air fluid exchange. So we measure the temperature also inside the eye. When you do air fluid exchange with the air, the, the, the temperature goes up a bit. If you stay under air for a while, the sticky oil will start to dissolve slowly. So you stay like uh, five minutes under air, it will, will disappear. And the last question is uh, between 1,000 centistokes and 5,700 centistokes. What is the main difference? Except so, of, of course, the length of the 5,000 is higher. And one is uh, 35 kilodalton, the other one is 70, 67 kilodalton. So the risk of emulsion is less. But I don't think uh, that makes difference, uh, big difference because the surfactants uh, are the main difference, not the length of the... Of the... So we, you, we can use uh, 5,000 silicon oil, but if we add the surfactants like a biosurfactant that we are producing, or we leave a perfluorocarbon carbon liquid, or there's a lot of low molecular weights component because that 5,000 is not pure, still you will have emotion. So I think mm -hmm. more in the purity of the oil in the our surgery that in the length of the molecules itself. Okay, send me an email with the purified uh, silicon oils to use. Send me an email, <laughs> okay. without, without your name on, without your name. Thank you, we have a question uh, to Dr. Romano. Have you used or tested the recents uh, for vitreous staining during surgery? We tested the triamcinolone, okay, not uh, the each brand, but I think uh, that are similar, you know, because uh, it's uh, the same molecule. There is Oxan HD um, from Bausch Lomb as heavy silicon also, not only denserone. Yeah, there's also Oxane, yeah, yeah. Of course, there's also Oxane actually. Uh, so another heavy silicon oil, but uh, I, uh, my experience with Doxane HD, I was not happy. So that's why I'm not using, I'm using the dance. I agree with Mario, absolutely. And I have <clears throat> epidemic cases of HD, uh, Bausch silicon. Uh, it was a terrible, it was a problem. Thank you. And what about the toxicity implications of inverted flap technique with standing ILM into the macular hole? Okay, so um, so uh, the, the macro hole. So you, you mean uh, the, if it can be toxic, the contact between the blue and RP? 
maybe it's uh, the question from uh, participant, but I think yes, uh, the okay. uh, question is about uh, dye, is about staining this flap. Okay, this is another uh, you know problem. So because uh, the blue itself is not cytotoxic, but again the blue plus light, you know, can be cytotoxic. And uh, so the, we have different uh, um, light sources, xenon, uh, uh, now, you know, the photon is another one. And uh, uh, so the point is, that another point is the distance between the blue and the light pipe, okay? At the end, what we found uh, that uh, um, is uh, even if you protect the RP is not a huge difference, you know, in the restoration of the um, external layers after um, macro hole closure, the point is uh, to have the light, uh, you know, um, far from the retina, and uh, you know we are we don't have to be uh, closer than one millimeter, okay? And uh, what we found also that uh, mm, so if uh, you stay for a while, then trying to peel uh, carefully every you know pieces uh, and uh, going uh, you know with light, uh, light, you can increase the phytotoxicity. Of course, this is only lab, uh, you know, experience. Uh, we cannot test uh, all these things in the humans, but uh, now we are using a different uh, RP, retinal pigment epithelium. So uh, a cell line that is, uh, uh, name is uh, RP edition 19. Uh, so they have a similar, you know, um, biological uh, uh, um, environment, okay? And we are testing different blue and different light. Uh, and uh, so, these are the preliminary results that the main problem is the distance. It's not the bridge self, but it's the distance and the time. Uh, excuse me, but I, I, I remember that my, uh, there's a beautiful paper by David Cho, who is the guy who did a lot of studies about light and toxicity. And he said that uh, when you change the wavelength of your illumination system, you can take uh, uh, 10 times more uh, time to do something with the eye and the interaction is a different thing between blue and light but if you use for example uh, the green light the green color light or the amber light you have multiple like the blue light so different wavelengths have different phototoxicity uh, we have to put that in in the fact that the combination now especially with the new ingenuity system that you can change the wavelength and how you look it has to do with resolution, has to do with toxicity, has to do with everything. So if you go into details, we're going to get crazy, but it has to be separated. But if anybody would like to see the toxicity, I think David Cho papers are, are beautifully presented. I don't, I, I'm sure you know about this uh, before that. We have one more question, I think, for all speakers. Do you have any concern using triamcinolone when I is nearly filled with PSL to stain the residual peripheral vitreous in surgery, retinal detachment surgery. No, we are using all the time for sure because you, we want to see the periphery of the vitreous, and this is a, that is the best moment because you know the retina is flat by PFCL and you can, but uh, you know still uh, you know uh, the interaction uh, so. We are in periphery, we are not doing uh, on the macula. So, uh, I mean, uh, risk, uh, uh, you know, the balance uh, is, uh, you know, to shape the videos in that moment. So, of course, but still uh, the interaction between decaline and tremcinolone, if you do that in the lab on the cell line is cytotoxic. So according to the ISO, you cannot, uh, I mean, be on the market if you are cytotoxic. Okay, and we have uh, one comment from Dr. Um, Fluorescein is a vital dye, not triamcinolone. 
the question was about staining with uh, with fluorescein. Uh, do you have some experience with uh, fluorescein? Sorry, I didn't understand. Some experience on? Uh, I asked uh, Zoran, do you have uh, oh. experience with uh, fluorescein for staining vitreous? No, I, in the 90s I did the staining with the ICG, but it was uh, abandoned. So after that, I, I'm using a dual globe by work. Thank you. And uh, could we have a second poll for audience? Uh, can you see the question? I use it just uh, to know simple, simple question, simple answers. I use chandelier for ID surgery routinely, never. It depends. Today we have fantastic audience, more than 150 participants during more than two hours. Okay, can you show for everybody this result? I'm really surprised about the 40%. Uh, back in 10 years from now, we did a presentation in the Uretina about the use of bimanual surgery. And bimanual surgery can be done only with a chandelier light. And then nobody was doing it. And uh, now everybody, 40%, are using it routinely. And uh, one nice thing about the chandelier lights is that can be re-sterilized and they're not so expensive. And they're different types. So I think it's time for the chandelier light to go uh, much more into practice than before. Of yeah. course, there's a technique, how to put of it, where to, where to put it, where's the tear, when you want to do it. There's also a learning curvature about the chandelier light. And, yes, uh, details, details how it, to which have the a great success, yes. Session, because you're going to have a lot of sessions like that. It's very interesting. I learned a lot today. I, I uh, use uh, chandelier light in almost 100% of my uh, all vitrectomies because it gives me free hands. Uh, I'm using both right and left hand for peeling. And then even for silicone oil removal, there is always some membrane or if we have to do ILM peeling, it's easier to, to, to peel everything with two hands than one. Thank you. Uh, more than two hours passed quickly and unnoticed. And I want to say uh, my deepest gratitude to everyone, to our fantastic speakers team, to our fantastic audience. And I hope everybody of us enjoy uh, this evening and uh, very much hope that um, this uh, webinar was uh, useful, was educative. I would like to tell you, I re was really surprised by the kind of moderation he had. You kept us in all, only the interesting subject. And I would like to thank you. It was a great experience. I've been in many, 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 many uh, seminars uh, this year. But I think this one was one of the best. Oh, and uh, thank, you. Diana, thank you very much for organizing that. You've been a great host. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, really. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.